Hey everyone, we're so glad to be back together today and are so grateful for this time we get to share. We love joining with you here online and want to come in each Sunday expectant for God to do something with these moments ahead of us. There are moments that can and should be marked by encountering God and moving into whatever may be next, carrying what God has done and what he continues to do. We have some pretty special opportunities as we gather together here today. And in addition to what I've already mentioned, I wanna invite you to get something ready so we can take communion later in this service. Communion is such a sweet time as we remember Jesus' sacrifice and proclaim the gospel in that. Be sure to get something ready and we'll share in that beautiful moment together. Another opportunity we have today is to pray together in big things and small things. We'd be honored to pray with you today and throughout this next week, if you'll just let us know how best to do that. I'm really looking forward to the moments ahead of us in joining with you in worship. Let's head over and then I will see you all in just a bit. Well, good morning, Christ Chapel. My name's Cameron. I'm a part of our women's ministry team. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for worship. Um, if this is your first time here, a special welcome to you. We're so glad that you're here. There is a connect card on the seat back in front of you. If you will fill that out, that gives us a chance to introduce ourselves, tell you who we are as a Christ Chapel family, and how you can get connected here. And no matter who you are, we want to pray with you and for you. We believe in going to God together for big and small things. So there's also a prayer card on the seat back in front of you. You can fill that out. Our staff would love to join you in prayer this week. And you can drop those off in the offering box um, outside the sanctuary. We believe here at Christ Chapel that marriage is a gift, and we have several ways for you to invest in that relationship. One of the ways I want to put on your radar is Avenue. Avenue is for young couples who are dating, engaged, or almost married, and this is a time for them to come together with other young couples and talk about the everyday things that might come up in marriage. This is usually something that takes place over the course of a semester, but we are offering it in one weekend during the month of May, which is great for long distance couples or if you have um, odd work hours, we would love to have you join us for that weekend. So you can find out more information on our website. Now would you stand and greet those around you as we begin our time of worship.
our Savior. that now. Good morning, Christ Chapel. 
Wonderful to be with you. We are going to uh, continue to worship as we celebrate communion. Uh, those of you joining us online, uh, thank you so much for choosing to spend a part of your uh, day with us. If you have those elements available to you, please go ahead and get those ready and we'll take the elements together so you can hold them once you uh, have them available. You know, as we've been doing this series on emotions, I think it's uh, it's been wonderful to see how Jesus has stepped into those emotions, whether it's been a feeling anxious or hurt or alone. But I think sometimes we can question uh, if Jesus can actually relate. We know that he can step into it, but can he relate to those emotions? And actually on the night that Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples, uh, he felt some very similar emotions. Uh, after the supper, when Jesus was going to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray for you and for me and for the strength to endure the cross, it says that he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he even said to his disciples, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Blows my mind that only then did he become sorrowful. Uh, he just began to be anxious in his soul. He knew that the Father was in control, but he also began to be sorrowful unto death because that's exactly what he was walking toward. He was walking toward the cross for you and for me. And that's what we celebrate as we come to the table. We celebrate that he sacrificed himself for us to make room for us at the table, to relate to us, not only now, but forever because there is a supper to come. And the supper to come is the marriage supper of the lamb that in Revelation chapter 19, it says that there was, I heard what seemed to be a voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, hallelujah for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come. And his bride, that is you and me, he has made us ready for him. See, there's a lot of sorrow between the suppers. Between the last supper with his disciples and the supper to come. But the good news is, is that the sorrow that he endured when he walked to the cross for you and for me is to relieve all the sorrow so there will never be sorrow again. The supper that we will enjoy, the marriage supper of the lamb, is one without sorrow, without tear without loneliness, without hurt, without being overwhelmed, all of those things are put at bay because of what Jesus has done for us. And so that's what we do in remembrance of him. So that's what we're gonna celebrate as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. So if you will, we'll start with the bread. It was on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, he says, this is my body that was broken for you. So we do that in remembrance of him, so take and eat. And on that same night, he took the cup and he said, uh, this cup represents the new covenant in my blood. The covenant being the promise. The promise that he not only made a way for us to have a seat at the table because we're sinners saved by his grace, his blood being shed for the forgiveness of our sins, but that promise endures, making sure that he knows that we have a place in the table for the marriage supper of the lamb. So when we take this and we drink this, we do this in remembrance of him. So take and drink. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you for the sorrow that you endured. Your son taking on the sorrows of our sin, the sorrows of the world. We thank you that you can therefore sympathize and empathize with the sorrows that we have. Lord, thank you for being that kind of high priest that intercedes for us. Thank you for making a seat at the table for us, reaching down to sinners like us, not only making us a, a seat at the table now, but a seat at the table forever. Lord, we do this in remembrance of you and we will continue to do it until you come again. So come quickly, Lord Jesus, and we pray it in your name, amen.
Morning, Christ Chapel. So glad you're here. I'm so honored and so humbled to get to be in the pulpit and get to preach God's word uh, to you this morning. I'm also so honored and blessed by getting to worship with you a week after week. My whole family is, uh, it is such a blessing to be a part of this congregation and to worship. And, and when I say worship, I don't just mean the incredible musicians that use their gift to lead us to the Lord, but also how we worship, how we serve together, how we as a church get to be on mission, all of those things that are worshipful. Uh, one of the other things that we really believe here at Christ Chapel is that even our giving is a part of our worship. Uh, we don't give because we're purchasing something from God. We don't give because we're paying membership dues. We give uh, to God. We give to God because we want to be a part of what he's doing and because uh, it's a response. It's a, it's a part of our worship. And so if that's the position of your heart, if you want to worship in that way, if giving is a part of your uh, worship here at Christ Chapel, there's always three ways. We want to always put those before you, and that's between you and the Lord. Uh, but you could text the number on the screen. Uh, you could give a physical gift if you brought that, or uh, you could go online and give. Uh, we really do just love getting to be a part of this uh, fellowship and get to, to run alongside uh, this church. It's such a blessing. Uh, we are going to be in God's Word. You're going to need a copy of the Scriptures and we are continuing in this series, uh, I Think I Feel I Am. Um, <clears throat> what we're going to see is uh, we're going to be in, in Psalms a lot this morning. And we're going to jump around really to three different uh, parts of David's life. And three different Psalms really that intersected his life in different circumstances. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to take a quick a quick stop by Mark chapter 9. And, and real quick, I'll just um, set it up this way. Um, Mark chapter 9, there's a desperate father. And there's a desperate father whose son is, uh, is filled with an unclean spirit, it says. So his son was demon-possessed, and, and it was awful. I mean, this father is desperate. The, the boy is being thrown into fires and thrown into water and convulsing. And the father is just trying to get help. The disciples can't help. Uh, Jesus comes onto the scene in Mark chapter 9. And the father even says, if you can help. If you can just show compassion, would you please do that? And Jesus says very clearly and very authoritatively, all things are possible for, he, for the one who believes. And now, now listen to the Father's response in Mark chapter 9, verse 24. Uh, the Father, it says this in verse 24. It says, immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And I love Mark chapter 9, verse 24. I love that prayer. In the very same breath, this desperate dad is saying, I believe, but in the same breath as, yes, I believe you can. You can save my son. You can heal. You can fix him. But in the same breath as he is affirming that, he's also saying, but also help. Because I, I, I need help in the places where my faith is weak. I believe, but also help my faith in ways that it, it still isn't really there. It's incredibly relatable. I think about the dad in Mark 9 often, and I think even in this series, uh, I've thought about it a lot, right? I, I have faith that you're powerful enough. God, I know that you can do this. I know that you can do this, but at the same time, God, help me believe that you can do this. And I think that those two prayers go hand in hand within the same breath as I think important for all believers. And as we've seen in the series, I think I feel I am, we, we've been looking at um, emotions that at times have gotten derailed. 
right? Emotions that at times have become almost an authoritative truth in our life. They've shaped our thoughts at times in certain seasons. Our, our emotions and our feelings can start to lie to us and start to shape our, our, even our identity, those I am statements. We start to conform to whatever the emotion of the season is. Um, and so when I see that, I, I think of the Father. And I think of this idea of, wait, my, I believe that this is true. I believe that this feeling isn't what is true. I, I believe what you say is true, God, but at the same time, help my unbelief because sometimes those feelings are so strong and they're so persuasive that as we navigate emotions that seem to pull us off sides in ways, Lord, we believe your word, but help, help those areas of our hearts, uh, of our feelings that we're not there yet. So this series has been um, really great for me to not only sit under, but get to study and, and walk with. And here's where we're going this morning. We've talked a lot about uh, different emotions. Uh, we've talked about fear and anxiety and, and loneliness. We've talked about lots, but what if uh, you find yourself, or what if you've got a loved one or a family member or a friend or a coworker? What if you've got somebody in your life, or maybe you're here this morning? What if you don't feel any of those things? What if actually what we struggle with is, is not, wow, I've got all these emotions that I'm wrestling with, but actually when it comes to the Lord, it, it feels dry, and you feel distant, and you feel numb. The term for that that we're going to talk about is spiritual apathy. Right? This idea and this concept of spiritual apathy, I believe you are who you say you are, Jesus. I believe that. I believe you did what you said you were going to do, but I don't really feel spiritually close to you. Right? I don't really feel passionately moved or inspired. Maybe that's you, or maybe you walked into worship today, or you're watching online, and you've got somebody heavy on your heart that you knew a time when they were on fire, and there was passion, and there was vibrancy, and they felt alive, and they seemed so close to the Lord, and maybe that was you, and, and then all of a sudden you look up, and maybe it's been a season of drought, I think if we define spiritual apathy, I'd define it as not having an enthusiasm for God. Maybe not even really having a concern for the things of God. There's a feeling of numbness. There's even a feeling of callousness that comes along with spiritual apathy. We just feel callous to the things of God. The music sounds great. The Bible's good. But I just don't feel close to the Lord. Uh, Martin Lord jones actually Makes, um, makes this idea of spiritual um, apathy almost synonymous with spiritual depression. Um, this kind of depressed idea in our souls. Um, and I think there is a range of what that can look like. Certainly in this room, there's going to be a huge range of how that might be impacting you. And I, I think um, to be really spiritually depressed and then even one step more dangerous than that is whenever that depression just turns into just numbness. And that can be really dangerous. Uh, going from depressed spiritually to, I don't really feel anything anymore. It's a dangerous place for a believer to be. Um, it's a season I found myself in. It's a season that so many people I've walked with have gotten to experience. Maybe it's a, a, a deep place of disconnect. Or maybe you're just in a season where you, you say, yeah, I know I'm, a, I'm alive and I, there's some good things happening. But there's still some things that I've... I want to cultivate in my heart. I want to cultivate my affections for the Lord. Like I said, it's a range. We're going to look at three sources of that apathy, and then we're going to look at biblical solutions. And specifically, we're going to look at David. We're going to look at three different um, interactions and parts of David's story and the solution. What, what brought him, what created a spiritual apathy in him, and then really kind of what solved it in the life of David. He was a man after God's own heart, right? We, we know that. A man after God's own heart. He had high highs, but he also had low, really low lows. And Psalms is this incredible book that we kind of get to, at least many of the Psalms that David wrote, kind of get to peek at his journal, right? His prayers, uh, his songs before God in some of those seasons. And so that's what we're going to do, identifying those three sources. And the first one is this. The first one, and maybe the most obvious, is that spiritual apathy, it can be a result of my sin. So if I want to set myself free from this spiritual apathy, if I want to move past it, if I, if I want to shake that off and get the cloud to lift, well, then I have to do some business with the Lord and identify, is there sin in my life that's unrepentant maybe? Maybe I know it's there and I'm, I'm suppressing it. Is there sin in my life that's producing this kind of apathy? Uh, David <clears throat> had plenty of sin. <clears throat> Excuse me. David had plenty of sin. 
Uh, but I think probably one of his most famous falls is uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12 uh, when, um, when he takes Bathsheba. Right? His sin against Bathsheba, ultimately his sin against Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. Um, I, I mean, he, he got this woman pregnant and then he tried to cover up his sin so much so he, that didn't work. His plan didn't work. He was, he was so callous. This man after God's own heart had gotten so apathetic to the heart of God, that it was just a, a tactical decision to have a man killed, to have Bathsheba's husband killed to, to protect the narrative of David's life. As a, as a PR shield for David, he was willing to, to, to leave Uriah out on the battlefield to die. Uh, and it, the amount of apathy and callousness to be able to get to that place, to be able to hide your sin and desire to hide your sin, that is a dry and that is an empty place. In God's grace, he gets busted, though. In God's grace, his sin gets found out. Uh, In God's grace, he is broken, rightfully so, over some sin. And and Psalm 51 is where I want to take us first, as we see a source of this apathy being David's clear sin. But then we get to see a little window into that apathy at play, even though there's plenty of passion tied to it as he's as he's writing this to God and praying this to God, here in Psalm 51, how he articulates to God the symptoms of that sin he's feeling. It's, uh, I'm just going to read verses 9 uh, through 12 and see a glimpse. This is a, a psalm that David wrote right in that context of brokenness over his sin. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence. You see the distance that he feels. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. We clearly hear the prayer of a man who is distant from the Lord, who is begging God, please don't separate me any further. Don't leave me. Don't abandon me. Make my heart new. Give me that joy that I used to have at salvation and I've lost that joy. Uh, intertwined in David's repentance is asking, though. It's asking for a fresh heart. It's asking that God would renew his spirit, asking that he wouldn't take the Holy Spirit away, that he would do those things. And David's sin took him to a place, really, where he was distant. It took him to a place that dried him out from his walk with the Lord. A man after God's own heart finds himself in, in this callous and numb place in 2 Samuel. He needs a new heart. For us, for us, as we evaluate a category of our lives that we must consistently bring before the Lord to say, God, would you show me, is there sin in my life? If I evaluate my life or even the loved ones that I'm walking with that I'm trying to encourage, is there unrepentant sin there that, God, I need to bring before you? I need to bring out, confess, and bring into the light. As we see in 1 John, we know you are faithful and just to forgive us. But we need to bring that into the light. Is there sin in your life that is then, yes, producing a callousness towards the Lord? Um, is that you? Um, I, I think one of the, one of the ways that I, I think I could illustrate that, or at least in my head, where my head goes, it may be a horrible illustration for y'all, but it makes sense to me, um, is this idea that we know uh, our salvation isn't at stake if we're in Christ, that when I sin, um, and I maybe feel numb, that that doesn't, necess- that doesn't mean that, that God has changed, that God no longer loves me. We're told in Romans 8 even that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not even, not even my own callous sin can separate me. But what it can do is I can grieve the Holy Spirit in my sin. And I can still, I can, I can still affect my fellowship. And I can still sit in a worship service and feel nothing. I can open up my Bible and just say, God, I don't feel you. And he says, well, you've got this sin. And, and so I have... I have removed myself from fellowship. Here's the way I would illustrate it. So uh, if, if this is the stage here, so um, if this shot, right, on the screen, this won't work if you're looking at me. You have to look at the screen for this to work, right? If, if this shot is, is what we're looking at here, then this is the presence of God, right? Well, God doesn't change. His presence doesn't change, but I can remove my fellowship from him. Right? Did God change? Nope, God's still right here, right? But I, I have removed myself, right? And so in that way, I think we can wrestle with, all right, God's character is intact, 
but I remove myself from his spotlight that never went anywhere. And then I find myself in the weeds and I think, God, where are you? You seem so distant and God, you're so far from me. And the reality is we see time and time again in scripture, Lord, have I, am I wandering? Am I wandering into things that I need to let down and bring into the light uh, for your glory to come? Do we see shame holding us back in the darkness? Do we, do we see shame being something that would keep us from being rejuvenated in ways that our God calls us to? Do we see Jesus as the Holy One who forgives and restores those are his, who are his? Is, is that how we see Jesus? Holy, forgiving, restorative. Or do we think, oh, he's not gonna, he's gonna be mad. I gotta get myself cleaned up before I can really come alive again, before I can reapproach him. And that's such a trap. Man, would we continue to see and study Psalm 51 is it's such an incredible psalm of, of repentance that we see here. And, and really my encouragement would be that we don't ignore it. That if the Lord graciously starts to reveal sin in our life, that we wouldn't ignore it. Um, that we'd look at it, that we, we would bring it into the light. But um, I think so often, so often I'm more afraid of what other people think of me than I am spiritual apathy taking root in my soul. Right? I, I, I should be more concerned about spiritual apathy being rooted in my, in my spiritual life rather than, well, if I bring this up and if I confess this and if I get accountability around me, what are they going to think? And I'm more worried about what other people might think. Godly friends in my life, godly community that God's given me to hold me accountable. I don't want to be accountable because I don't want them to think less of me. And so I'll just sit and get number and number and number. Would we not ignore it? Would we spend time confessing? And would we receive the forgiveness that's already been purchased for us? And and then spend time prioritizing that accountability. There's a second source, though, too. Right? Maybe you're in this room and you don't sin. Good job. Um, there's a second source of where apathy and spiritual apathy can take root, right? Where a shallowness can take root. And it's, it's maybe not sin. And, and for the record, I think we are probably will find ourselves in all of these categories. But that second category is a spiritual apathy that can be a result of my circumstances, Right? It's not anything I've done. It's just the circumstances that I'm living in. 2 Samuel 15 and 16, uh, another time in David's life uh, was a whirlwind. Right? He, he was in 2 Samuel 15 and 16, he was running from his son. He was in the Judean wilderness. Uh, it was a wild season of his life. It, it wasn't really anything directly that he did that put him there. It was more people that were doing that to him, and so he finds himself in this wilderness, not by his own choice, uh, not necessarily by any direct consequences, um, and yet listen to how David describes his condition. When he's in that Judean wilderness, he, he writes Psalm 63, and just, I'll just read verse 1 over you. David says this, he says, Oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. And then he says, My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. David's circumstances are producing such stress in his life. Um, he's experiencing such deep spiritual dryness. God felt distant to David, even though he wasn't, he wasn't doing anything wrong. It was the circumstances around him. He, he wasn't in active sin. It was just the world. It was what had, was happening to him. All of a sudden, felt this, I am so dry. I am so parched. I'm I'm in a wilderness, and this is a picture of my soul, a desert. How about for us? What do those look like for us? Uh, we, could spend, we could spend an entire hour trying to parse and nuance what are those things in your life. I don't think that's my role. I think that's going to be between you and the Lord today, um, you and the Holy Spirit, to be able to figure out what that looks like, because I think as many people are here, is a different way that we might find busyness as a way that we... We grow apathetic, busy doing good things even, working hard, or, or we might find coping mechanisms like, man, we stressful day and we just want to go home and watch TV until we can't keep our eyes open to, to, to numb us from just the stress of our life. There's all kinds of patterns maybe that change in our life. I know for Danielle and I, my wife and I, whenever our spiritual rhythms and so many of our spiritual disciplines got knocked off uh, of kilter whenever we had our boys, right? Whenever we had kids, all of a sudden, all those spiritual disciplines and quiet times, those went out the window, right? And it, 
And our son's 10, and I'm still trying to find a lot of those. <clears throat> Any day, though, I'm going to figure it out, and I'll let you know. <clears throat> right? There's, there's busyness. There's, our communities change. So many different circumstances. But evaluate those. And, and here's, here's one more. I'll give you just one more category, but um, I'm not the Holy Spirit in your life. I'm, I want you to interact with, with him on that. But here's the other category I'd say is maybe the dryness isn't, um, isn't just busyness. Maybe it's God's been trying to get your attention. Maybe God's been asking you to step into something. It's not that you're doing something wrong, but maybe you know who you are. God has been tugging at your heart, asking you to take the step of obedience, take the step of faith, maybe serve in this way or partner in this way or share with this person. God's kind of asked you to be obedient in a certain way and, and you're not doing anything bad or wrong, but you just, that's scary and you're not sure if you're ready for that and, and, and you're having a, a negotiation with God and maybe you've been holding on for a while and then you look up and you think, man, I just feel dry. Could it be that God's asking you to take that step of faith, to be obedient to what he's put on your heart, where he's leading you, he will provide the courage. He will provide the equipping as you take those steps of faith. Um, David sought the Lord. Right? He, he sought the Lord. He sought him. He, he trusted that the Lord would be his rejuvenation. Even in Psalm 63, we, we see that, yes, he's dry for no fault of his own, but he goes to the Lord and says, you will be, you are who will refresh me. I hope we can be a people who will run to the one who can sustain and refresh us. Run to the one who can sustain and refresh us rather than running to all the other things we do to take our mind off of how hard our life could be, the busyness of our world. Create those boundaries to make sure we're connected deeply to the vine. Spiritual apathy is dangerous. It's dangerous. We've got to repent. We've got to set godly boundaries We've got to find our way back to that source of life, experiencing the fruit that we know we were called to. But what if it's not sin? What if it's not circumstances? What if you just feel empty and distant? What if you've got people in your life that you're walking with and counseling, and they just feel distant from the Lord? They can't put their finger on it, and you can't counsel them, or you've sat long enough to think, man, I used to be so much closer, and I don't know what it is. And you've just chalked it up to, I guess it's just that season of life. Um, you feel, man, maybe God was so much closer. Has he abandoned me now? The answer is no, but I do think it's really important. Third category of where a source of this apathy can be, I think it's really important that we understand in the Christian life that spiritual apathy can also just be. Right? It, it can just be in our, our life. Not a symptom of our sin, not because of wild circumstances in our life. It just is. And we think, God, I don't feel very close to you in this season. I don't know if I'm doing something wrong or what. And at times, I think it's really mature and healthy for, for believers to have open hands and hold the tension in the Christian life, in theology, that sometimes it just is. I mean, we see that in Job, that there is always this category of suffering that's we don't know. We don't have perspective of why it is, but there it is. And I want to get real practical with a biblical solution to something we don't even know where it comes from because I think there is a biblical solution. You're not helpless, right? If you feel distant and dry, you're not helpless. There is a biblical next step for that kind of emptiness and that kind of dryness, even when we don't know the cause. And Psalm 13, I love what David does here. And the context of Psalm 13 I love also because um, we don't know the context. A lot of the Psalms, Psalm 63 and Psalm 51, even Psalm 103, we know so much of what was going on in David's life when he's writing this and praying this and singing this. Psalm 13, we don't know the context, but look at how David is feeling spiritually abandoned and distant. In the first two verses, there's only six verses in this, in this chapter. In the first two verses, this is what David says to the Lord. He says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Has God forgotten me? I can't see his face. Where are you, God? How are you letting this happen? I don't think I've done anything wrong. 
and yet I don't feel you. Aren't you supposed to be here? I don't feel you. Look what he does. <laughs> Same chapter. We just saw how he started that chapter, verses 1 and 2. Look how he lands that chapter in verses 5 and 6. David says, but, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. David takes steps of faith even when he doesn't feel like it. He still takes those steps. And I love what he does with the past tense and the future tense in those two verses. But I, I have trusted in your steadfast love. Right? He has dealt bountifully with me. Right? It's this past tense. I'm going to look at what I know to be true. I remember how you have dealt with me. I remember what you've done and who you are. And then this, these future tense I shall rejoice. I will sing to the Lord. Even when I'm in this tension of, I know you have been good, but I don't see it right now, but I will choose to continue to rejoice and to praise. Not blind optimism for the sake of being positive, but sitting in the truth of who God is with hope that he will continue to be a good God. Stay focused. Would we stay focused on the one whose goodness never ends. That's our challenge. When we don't know why, we don't know where it came from, that we would stay focused on the one, stay focused on, on Jesus. We know what he's already done. Stay focused. His goodness never ends. It doesn't expire. We're designed to be connected to the one who made us, right? We're, we're told that when we're connected to him, there are going to be these seasons of fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit, when we're connected to him, is love and joy and peace. It's these incredible fruits of, of, of life-giving things coming out of a place of apathy and coming back to a, a passionate and worship-filled walk. That's a good, healthy, sweet goal to walk out of seasons of maybe deep apathy, or maybe you're here and you just say, there are some parts of my heart that have gotten callous. I love the Lord still, but there are some parts of my heart that have really gotten callous. And, and yes, he is sufficient for me, but I don't want to go stale. I don't want to be stale in my walk. I want to ever be bringing those things before him. That is good. I want to get back to deeper and deeper, passionate, worship-filled walk. That is healthy goal. But... Let me give this caution before I land this plane. Let me tell you what isn't healthy. As we evaluate potential apathy and as we search for kind of a rekindled passion, here's our, our warning. Here's my warning to us. Spiritual passion and emotion are not the same thing as spiritual maturity and love. Right? Spiritual passion and fervor and emoting a lot, that's not the same thing as spiritual maturity and, and real love. And I can easily make that mistake in a sermon like this, and we could leave and say, yeah, the equivalent to, to being more in love with God has to be I must have to show more emotion. That's, that's what I need. That's what I'm missing. Um, I need to get all the feels back. That's what I'm missing. But again, more emotion doesn't mean more Jesus. It means more emotion. That's what it means right? Passion is a, a good thing that can be a, a fruit of our walk, and it's something that we can cultivate, um, but also passion can become an idol, right? Our, our passion, our desire to feel deeply, um, that could be a sweet thing to pursue, but it can also quickly become an idol to say, man, I'm not a varsity Christian if I'm not really feeling and emoting and, and doing all of those things. Freedom from apathy does not look like conformity in worship, right? It doesn't look like a performance or even a place where it's like, oh man, I'm, I'm really getting after worship. God's wired us differently. He's given us different capacities and different emotions and, and even our connection, our deep, deep connection won't look the same. The, the body of Christ is, is diverse and it should be diverse. It, we shouldn't all conform to that same thing. People are wired to worship and express emotions differently. I was actually just talking about this with Cody this past week. Um, you, Cody, my brother who is filled with probably more Holy Spirit than I am, right? And yet we worship very differently. We were standing in the back of a worship service on Wednesday night, and I have a hard time not, you know, moving a lot. 
I just, it's in my genes, right? I just, I, when worship's happening, I'm moving, I get my flag out and start waving it. Um, just kidding, I don't, please don't send emails. I don't wave flags in worship. Um, <clears throat> Right, I, I do, I, I'm, I'm just way more motivated. And, and talking with Cody about it, it's, it's such a cool picture of the body because he worships so deeply, but he's, he's not distractingly swaying like maybe I am. For me, that stirs my affection. For him, his worship is deep, but it looks different than mine. As soon as we start comparing, as soon as we start looking at other people, well, that person's really seemed, wow, that, they're so, wow, every time they walk it, they just have a lot, they must be varsity. As soon as we start comparing to each other, what, what do we just do? We just took our eyes off Jesus. Our worship and our passion, it, it didn't become this honest, genuine pursuit to say, Lord, do what you will with my heart. Keep chiseling away the callousness of my heart. It becomes a, oh God, I need this emotion level. And, and that's where this can be really dangerous. That's an important um, caution, I think, for us to all consider and, and think about. And I, I know so many friends of mine who, who will just keep searching for the next most passionate, exciting, emotional thing. And um, that's not how relationships are designed. And, and God's depth is rooted in things that are much deeper than that, although he certainly uses and, and cultivates our feelings and our emotions uh, in ways, especially when our heart is numb. So here's a final exercise. Our final exercise, which we've been doing at the end of all of these sermons, which I've loved because it, it realigns my heart. It realigns what is true in my mind. Uh, we'll walk through this together. And in light of spiritual apathy, in light of these, these sources of where it comes from and truth that we need to speak into it, what must we do? Well, we listen to God's word. We remember and we believe those I am statements, who we are. Rather than starting with our feelings that, God, I feel so distant and dry and God, are you even there? And I don't really feel God at all. Instead of starting with our feelings, we start with what do we know to be true? Who has he said I am in Christ? And Point us to Colossians chapter 2 that we see that I am, I am made alive by God's grace through faith in Christ. Right? That, that, that box on the bottom of your sermon notes that you are made alive by God's grace through faith in Christ. Colossians 2, 13 and 14, Paul says this. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive Together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. That's amazing. That's the gospel. This beautiful picture that we were dead. We didn't bring anything to the table. We were dead. And through what he nailed to the cross, my penalties, my debt, my sin, those who are in Christ, I am now made alive because of what he's done. I was dead, remember, spiritually. And yet, when I get spiritually apathetic, I think I have to do all the work. I think, oh man, I'm, rather than this beautiful surrender that, that happened in the first place that has now shaped my identity. The reality of this passage shapes who we are. It's something we can hold fast to when we don't feel God's presence closely. We can hold fast to what we know to be true in Scripture, the reality of who we are and whose we are in Christ. We're alive. And then as I realize that truth of who I am, then I think on those things. I, I let my, my, my thought life align with this biblical reality. I think about this new life in the already and the not yet. Right? I consider all that God has done and will do in, in the future but also is available here. And even a few verses later, Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, he says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And he says in, in verse 2, Set your minds on things that are above, not on things on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Man, the reality the reality that my life is not my own, that yes, I, my old self is dead and buried in the tomb with Jesus and now I'm his, I'm, I'm alive and now I can set my mind on thinking of the things of Christ, who he says I am, th those truths. And instead of running to all the different coping mechanisms, running to all the different ways that I might uh, want to chase my own glory or, or chase 
what the world has to offer. Instead, I can remember who I am and then I can set my mind. And then my hope and our prayer is, Lord, would you then, would you then allow us to feel, feel sparks as my faith increases? Right? That, that would be, a, that would be a, a symptom of us realigning our identity and our minds with this truth that then the tale of our feelings would follow later. But then the sparks would return. And, and I say sparks because there might be seasons where it's not, you don't walk out floating on Shekinah glory after doing this exercise or spending a great quiet time. We say, Lord, would I feel the sparks? If you've ever tried to start a campfire with flint, oh man, it's awful. It's a horrible experience. But you just, you got one job, right? There's not a lot I can do other than just create sparks. But it ignite. I just, I keep staying faithful. I'm just going to keep doing it until my hands fall off. And would you ignite it? And, and that's what we're doing in our hearts. Align ourselves with what's true. And then feel sparks as, as what has to increase faith. This whole thing is a, a thing of faith. We are saved by grace. We're made his. God, I believe. Help my unbelief. Just like the father in Mark 9. I believe You've made me new. You've made me alive. You are present with me. You don't change. Your character is good. The callousness can go away. I do believe, but God, my faith is also weak. So in the same breath, just like the father in Mark 9, I believe, help my unbelief. Help those callous, numb areas of my heart. For you, for me, for the people you love, that you're going to be praying for throughout this day, God, would you give them enough faith to just take that next step, to ask the Lord. And I want us to do just that, to end our time, to end this sermon. Uh, I want us to put that in practice. I'm going to pray for us, and then Josh is going to come out. And so the last thing we'll do is we'll do exactly what David did. David didn't feel God. He didn't feel close to God. He he was in the wilderness. He was dry at times. This man after God's own heart. And David in Psalm 103, he has to tell his soul, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. He's got to tell his soul that. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. I'm, I'm talking. I mean, David is, is commanding. He's grabbing his dry, withered, apathetic, numb soul and saying, soul, Bless the Lord because he's worthy of it. He deserves it. I'm made for it. And so what better way to end this than really just going before the Lord and putting into practice that truth, to bless the Lord, to remember, to not forget. Let me pray. Father, we love you, and we're so grateful for how you love us. We're grateful for your grace in our life. We're grateful for the gospel that's made us new for those who are in Christ. The gospel that has taken a dead people and made us alive. So God, would you continue to cultivate us? Would you help us to not, to not just shift it into neutral, to not just coast, to not grow numb, to not be apathetic or, or grow stale? God, would you reveal those areas? Maybe it's sin that you, you so graciously would convict us to, would give us the faith to walk away from it. Maybe it's circumstances that uh, that we need to sit with you in, or maybe it's just still a mystery, but we know your goodness is still here. Help us teach our soul to take one baby step of faith after the other. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us first. In the name of Jesus, amen. What is that thing that God has done for you in your past? What is that great thing he has provided for you, has shown you, I want to challenge you to think about that as we respond in worship. I'll just tell you mine. I am grateful for the leaders of this church and the Bible teachers because when it comes to the Word of God and it comes to you and me, they are not apathetic. They care, and we are so blessed to be a part of this fellowship. Uh, would you stand and think about that one thing and respond together as we sing, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let's sing together. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. 
Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. He has done great things. He has done great things. He has done great things. Bless His holy name. So together we do this. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. We are truly blessed. Amen. Uh, we want to put one thing on your radar, and this series has been so rich for us certainly to preach. Uh, we've got a class that's going to start May 19th. If you want to dig deeper in what it looks like to really uh, align and, and sync up our emotions with what is true, we'll have a class here at Fort Worth campus. Uh, we'd love for you to join us. You go online and register for that. That'll start in two weeks. We want to put it before you. If this has been rich, but you want even more, then we'd love to keep walking with you. Also, if there's any next steps that you're curious about, there'll be some ministers right outside these doors. We'd love to help you. And as always, we love you, church. Let us know how we can pray for you. We'll be down front. We'd love to pray for you. God bless you. Have a great week. It's been a beautiful time together. And I hope we've all stepped further in faith today and continue to take steps in the time to come. We're grateful that we get to join together like this and can't wait to gather again next Sunday. And before you go, be sure to let us know how we can pray for you throughout this next week and even today. Prayer is no small thing, and we'd be happy to step into that with you over things that may be big or small. Until we're back together, we hope you have a great week, and then we'll see you all next Sunday.